For those of you who have been a part of Lakeside for a while, you know that this is the time of the year, the first Sunday of the new year, when I bring a special message to the church called the annual State of the Church Address. And for those of you who are relatively new to Lakeside, I need to explain that the State of the Church Address is something a little bit different than what we normally do here at Lakeside on Sunday mornings. Rather than being engaged in a verse-by-verse exposition of Scripture, the state of the church address is different. It's an opportunity that I have as your pastor teacher to share my heart with you about what I would like to see take place at Lakeside in this new year. I trust that the Lord has led me, that these are not things that I believe, but that God has put on my heart, and I believe them because of that. Now, I started doing these State of the Church addresses way back in the 1980s. I I think it's been a healthy exercise for us as a church body because it helps us to avoid becoming stagnant and accepting the status quo by forcing us to evaluate ourselves, to examine ourselves in light of Scripture and to see what areas as a church that we might be deficient in. Now, I mentioned to you last January, and I'm sure you all remember this, I mentioned to you last January in my State of the Church address, a very wise statement by a man that I've come to admire greatly, a man by the name of Robert Chapman. He was a leader in the early Brethren movement in England. In fact, Charles Spurgeon said he was the most godly man that he had ever met. In ministering to a young man leaving for the mission field, Chapman gave these very sage words of advice. He said, keep low, look up, and press forward. Keep low, look up, and press forward. Now, those are not just wise words for a young missionary going to the field. Those are wise words for every believer in Christ, especially as we begin a new year. We should keep low, meaning that we should be humble. We should look up, meaning that our focus must be on Christ himself, and we should press forward by growing in our relationship with the Lord himself. And the only way really to make progress in our relationship with Christ is by obeying his word. There is no other way to make progress. That is progress, to obey his word. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so as we begin a new year of our lives and a new year in the life of our church, I want to tell you where I believe we need to make some changes in order to press forward in our obedience to the Lord. But first, first, let me tell you, even before that, that I think, by way of encouragement, we have every reason to be very thankful to the Lord for the blessings that he's given us this past year at Lakeside. Looking back over this year, I think we should be encouraged because there continues to be this great sense of unity in our church as we strive together to evangelize the lost by sharing the gospel as well as helping believers to grow in their faith by teaching the Bible. Now in relation to evangelizing the lost this year has seen many members of our church actively, aggressively engaged in sharing the gospel both in their own individual witnessing efforts as well as through various church ministries that specifically focus on reaching our community with the gospel. Now, you should know this. All of our church ministries have the goal, the desire, the objective to evangelize the the lost when they're engaged with them. But there are certain ministries at Lakeside that have evangelism as their primary emphasis. I'm not going to give you statistics. I'm just going to give you a broad picture. For example, there's a ministry called Neighborhood Evangelism, This is a ministry where people in our church go door to door in the areas around, the neighborhoods around our church, endeavoring to share the gospel with our neighbors. Now, some listen and some don't, but they're there, and they are willing to share with anybody who will listen. There's a ministry called the Good News Club, a ministry where members of our church have actually the opportunity to go into the public school system and share the gospel with children. What What a great open door that is. It's the ministry known as Wood Valley, which is a ministry of compassion in giving food and material goods to those who are in need and then proclaiming Christ to them in a sermon. 
Lakeside Christian School is a ministry of evangelism. Hundreds of students every day are hearing about Jesus and the way of salvation. In addition, our school is now reaching out with an Acts class Bible study on the fundamentals of the faith to the parents of our students whose mother tongue is Spanish. Lakeside Christian School is also extended their ministry to foreign exchange students. Last year, we had a student from China. This year, we have three foreign exchange students, two from Germany and one from Japan. And you know what? We could do an even better job of exposing them to Christianity and the gospel if we could find homes for them from the members of our church. And we also continue to support a host of missionaries around the world who, listen, every day they are sharing Christ with the unsaved. Once again, this last year, we as a church have been involved in short-term mission trips with SOS, where evangelism is always a priority. But in addition to evangelizing, our church continues to emphasize Bible teaching in order to help believers to grow in their faith. And we do this in a number of ways. As you know, the pulpit ministry of Lakeside is a ministry to help people to grow, to equip them in their faith. We're now... We're now um, Those messages, in fact, our whole worship service is available on live stream where people from anywhere in the world can watch our worship services. I have a friend in Perth, Australia, the other, literally the other side of the world who watches. And if he's watching now, I say, hello, Joel. So we have uh, adult Sunday school classes that teach the word, Acts classes on Wednesday nights, home fellowship groups centered around the word, home Bible studies. There's the Insight for Women's Bible study on Thursday mornings. There's a Thursday morning men's Bible study. We have a WANA for our children. We have a a great Sunday morning children's ministry where our our little ones are clearly taught the word of God. I visited a class of two-year-olds last Sunday morning and was thrilled to see the word of God being taught to them. We also have a wonderful youth group in our church, led by Spencer King, where young people are not only taught scripture, they are discipled. We also have a great college and career ministry where the same thing is going on, led by Jason Bruns. There's the Source of Light correspondence courses. There's verse-by-verse radio where many people, how many, I I don't know, it's got to be thousands in the Tampa Bay area are listening to God's word Monday through Friday. We have a biblical counseling ministry where people can come and and unburden their hearts and hear biblical solutions to their problems. Now, in addition to these many individuals, uh, these, these many ministries, there are other individuals who are being mentored and discipled by members of our church who, who meet together on a regular basis. And all these ministries, and, and many more that I failed to mention just because of time, are all centered around the teaching of God's word for the growth of believers. And then there are many ministries that we have at Lakeside that really don't fit into any specific category of either evangelism or discipleship, but they are ministries of of just love and compassion. Compassion for those who are hurting and who are in need, and they're shown God's mercy, and they're shown God's love and care through members of Lakeside ministering to them. I have been pastor teacher at Lakeside for over 33 years. Hard to believe, but it's true. And I can honestly say that I think that we are living in the greatest days in the history of our church. And the only reason for this is really the grace of God, just God's grace. For some reason, known only to God, he has sovereignly chosen to to make this relatively small church in comparison with mega churches on Sunset Point Road in Clearwater, Florida, very, very special. See, now you might not realize how unique Lakeside is if you've grown up at Lakeside or if this is the only church that you've ever known as a believer, but I can assure you that this church is unusual. It's, it's rare. It's rare to find a church that endeavors to be biblically balance in the sense of being committed to evangelism, passionate about Bible teaching and doctrine, and at the same time devoted to caring for its members with love and compassion. But I I believe that's what we have here at Lakeside. Now, this doesn't mean that we're flawless in these areas or in any other area associated with our church. Far from it. 
There are times when we fail to evangelize like we should. There are times when we have failed to show love to our people like we should. But when we become aware of these failings, we don't simply accept them and say, well, it happened. We acknowledge these failures as, as sin and we repent and we try to correct our failings and do a better job. Now this morning, as we look ahead to this new year that is before us, I want to bring to your attention two areas in the life of our church where I believe we are deficient and we need correction. So here's what I'd like to see at Lakeside in the year 2015. Number one, I'd like to see us be more committed to praying together. Praying together. There's a little sign I have in my study that reads, prayer without study is presumption, and study without prayer is atheism. Now, the reason I have these words in my office is because I need to be reminded to be diligent in both studying the word as well as praying. But of these two reminders, the one I need the most, though, is the reminder to pray. See, regardless of all the studying that I do, if I don't spend time in prayer depending upon the Lord to open my understanding of his word and then to empower me as I preach his word, then as my sign says, I am living as a practical atheist. Living as if God doesn't exist because I have excluded him from the entire process of studying and ministering his word. Well, this lack of prayer is the same danger that I see us facing as a church body. If we are not dependent upon the Lord, if we're not looking to him in prayer, then we are living as if he really doesn't exist. As if everything in life and everything in the life of this church is dependent upon us and our efforts to accomplish things. Now, I'm concerned about our commitment to prayer at Lakeside, not because we don't believe in it. I I believe we have the right doctrine, the right teaching about prayer. But I think that we have failed in the practice of praying And that concerns me. And the reason for my concern arises out of the fact that so few of you come to pray when we have an all-church prayer meeting. As you may recall, a number of years ago, our elders decided to devote several Sunday evening services a year for the congregation to come together for the sole purpose of praying. And now, the first time we did this, there was a huge turnout But that large turnout has never occurred again. In fact, so few come out to pray on these specially designated Sunday evenings that it causes me to wonder if this is indicative of a deeper problem in our church, that perhaps this lack of praying together as a congregation indicates is a sign of a lack of praying when you're alone. That concerns me because one of the marks of a healthy Christian And one of the marks of a healthy church is a commitment to pray. And the reason for this is because all growing believers and all healthy churches understand how spiritually weak they are, how desperate they are for the Lord to bring about change and character transformation. So they spend time with him in prayer, looking to him. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, nothing of any spiritual value. See, believers in Christ who are growing in their faith understand that one of the greatest dangers, and I would add perhaps the greatest danger facing them is to become self-sufficient. This was the primary problem of the church at Laodicea. They had become self-sufficient. They were operating independent of the Lord, failing to see how much they, they needed him for everything and anything. In the book of Revelation, the Lord confronted this church about their independent, self-sufficient spirit. In Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 14, we we read this, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Now this was a church that Jesus said was lukewarm meaning that they were half-hearted. That's what he means. Half-hearted in their devotion to him. They weren't cold. They weren't hard-hearted towards him. It's not like they didn't care about anything concerning the Lord and his work, but they weren't hot in their excitement, their enthusiasm about him either. And the Lord told them that their lukewarmness made him 
nauseous. That's what he means when he says that if you don't repent, I'm going to spit you out of my, my mouth. It would cause him to, to throw up, meaning that he would remove them as a church. He would just put them out of business so that they didn't exist anymore. Gone. And the reason they were so unenthused and so indifferent about the Lord is that they just didn't see how much they really needed him. They were self-sufficient. Why? Because they didn't think they had any needs. They didn't think they were lacking in anything. They didn't see a need for the Lord to be involved in their lives. That's why Jesus said in verse 17, because you say I'm rich and I've become wealthy and have need of nothing. You don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and, and naked. No wonder a few verses later, the Lord says to them, these often misunderstood words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Now, contrary to how this verse is often used, this is not an invitation for an unsaved person to open their heart to Jesus and let him into their, their life. Now, this is an invitation not to unbelievers, but to believers to believers, to stop excluding Jesus from his own church, to let him into the local church because he is standing outside. He's knocking at the front door of the church, hoping that someone hears, that someone from the church will open the door of the church and let him in to have his rightful place as Lord and head of the church. Now, my concern for Lakeside is that we not become like the church at Laodicea and exclude the Lord from our lives. My desire is that you as the members of the church spend time each day in prayer, seeking the Lord, opening your hearts to him, having a quiet time, praising him, thanking him, making requests of him. There is no question that the Bible teaches that we are to spend time in prayer. The Bible is filled with statements that assume that we are praying as well as commands that we are to pray. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, but when you pray, he's not even telling us to pray. It's an assumed fact that believers spend time in praying. When you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus once again assumes that we are praying and gives us a model for how to pray, a model of principles for prayer. The Lord himself is our example, our model of the kind of prayer life that we should have. Like him, we should face every day, spending time with the Father. We should be praying when we face a crisis, praying when we need to make major decisions, praying for others, praying for uh, giving praise to God in our prayers, giving thanks, all of these things, and on and on it goes. And through the apostles, the Lord has taught, taught us many times to, to pray. To pray, one such exhortation is Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. Paul said, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul said, I am dependent on you people praying for me. So all of us who are believers in Christ are to be spending time in, in prayer in private. I think there's no question the Bible makes that abundantly clear. But what may not be as clear, what may not be as obvious, is that the Bible also says that we are to pray together as a congregation. Now, you may wonder, well, where does it say that? Well, it says that in the example given to us in Scripture of the early church at Jerusalem. They are a model of a congregation that spent time in prayer together because they knew how needy they were. For example, Acts chapter 1, verse 14. This is right after the Lord has, has gone back to be with the Father. This is the first time, first time ever these disciples are without Christ's physical presence. Now what are they supposed to do? Jesus just said, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But what will life be like without them? This is the first time he's not been around them. So we read in Acts 1.14, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They were praying together. Then on the day of Pentecost, the church was officially formed that day. What were their priorities? Acts 2.42 says they were continually 
devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, continuously devoting themselves. What did they pray about? We would assume anything and everything that was a concern to them. And when this church faced a crisis, what did they do? I think this is one of the key passages. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Now about that time, Herod, the king, laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. Peter is in jail. What are they praying for? Obviously, they're praying that he wouldn't be executed like James was. Fervently praying for him. The whole church gathered. This was an all-church prayer meeting. And you know what? God answered their prayers. The problem is that they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. A little bit later, Acts chapter 12, starting really verse 13. But let me, let me give you for the sake of time what has happened. An angel has come to the prison. Miraculously has opened the doors. The guards are asleep. They don't even notice Peter is going out. And this angel leads Peter out. This is in response to the prayers of the church of Jerusalem. Leads Peter out of the jail. He's on the streets of Jerusalem. He goes to the home where the church was meeting and knocks on the door. And we read this in verse 13. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice... <laughs> Because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. Now remember, they've been praying for Peter to be released. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. Now why should they have been amazed? Isn't this what they've been praying for? So here's an instance where a church prayed together, but they had very little faith in God. Their faith was weak. Yet in spite of their weak faith, God did answer them, and he honored that. They may have been weak in faith, but at least they knew that they were to come together and pray as a church body seeking God. What would I like to see at Lakeside this year? I'd like to see that when we have an all-church prayer meeting, that all the church comes out and not a fraction of the church. That's what I'd like to see. Now, I, I am a little hesitant to say something like what I just said for two reasons. Number one, because in the past I have appealed to you before about coming out to pray. It hasn't made much of a difference, and I don't, I don't like badgering people. Secondly, because I don't want anyone to come to a prayer meeting for the wrong motives, just because you feel pressure from, from me, or you come out because of feelings of guilt and obligation. My role is not to coerce you, but to lovingly shepherd you. But you see, as a believer in Christ, you should want to pray with other believers. You should feel like you want to be here. Not that you have to, but that you want to. Really, I shouldn't have to be exhorting the church for this. This is prayer. This is not something horrible. This is prayer. It should be a priority for you. You shouldn't need me to tell you you need to do this. You should want to pray because God is a loving father who has promised to answer the prayers of his children. I won't take the time to read it. Maybe they'll put it on the screen. But Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, I'll paraphrase. Seek, knock, ask. Because if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give to you? We're his children. He loves us. He wants us to pray. And when you pray together, you know what's going on in other people's lives. You can help bear their burdens and you can pray intelligently. It isn't just a matter of praying with somebody. It's a matter of knitting your heart with them and coming alongside and bearing their burdens and praying with a prayer that's well informed. That's what I'd like to see at Lakeside this year. There's something else, one other thing at Lakeside I'd like to see. I'd like to see a greater attendance in our Sunday evening service in general. Not just the prayer meeting, but in general. 
Now, I realize this is a little bit of a tricky issue to address because there is not a specific verse nor a specific command in the Bible telling us that we need to have a Sunday morning as well as a Sunday evening service. However, it's important to keep in mind that there isn't anything in Scripture that prohibits having a Sunday morning and Sunday evening service either. And it is my firm conviction that more of you should be here on Sunday night simply because it would benefit you spiritually. It's not for my sake. I, I really am not that interested in the size of crowds. It's for your sake. Now, I understand that for some people, you cannot be here on Sunday nights, and, and you have very justifiable reasons. I understand that some people just don't see well enough to drive at night. Others are locked into certain activities on Sunday nights that are beyond their control. And I realize that, that, that there are times when some can't make it out because their children are ill. But for the vast majority, I suspect that you don't come out on Sunday evenings because you don't think it's important for you to be here. It's inconvenient. It's not a priority. And that's a shame because on most Sunday evenings, we are engaged in a healthy study of the Word of God. And if you are growing spiritually by hearing and applying the Word preached on Sunday mornings, then you would grow even more by hearing and applying the Word preached on Sunday mornings as well as Sunday evenings. Tim Challies is a very well-known Christian blogger out of Toronto. <laughs> he also serves as one of the pastors of his churches. Last January, not this January, but last January, he wrote an article entitled, Why I Love an Evening Service. Here's what he said at the beginning of this article. He said, of all the casualties the church has suffered in recent decades, I wonder whether many will have longer lasting consequences than the loss of the evening service. There was a time not so long ago when many or even most churches gathered in the morning and the evening, but today the evening service is increasingly relegated to the past. At Grace Fellowship Church, that's the name of the church he's pastors, we hold on to the evening service and wouldn't want it any other way. It's a commitment to be sure, a commitment for the pastors to plan a, a second service and to prepare a second sermon, and a commitment for the members to give the church not only the morning but also the evening. But these are small costs compared to the great benefits. So what are the great benefits of coming out on Sunday night? Well, Chalice mentions a few of them. I'll, I'll just mention three that he gives. He says an evening service allows you to begin and end the day with God. That's a precious thought. It is the Lord's day. Secondly, he says it allows you another opportunity to serve the Lord and his people. There are all kinds of ways to serve Christ in a Sunday evening service. Third, he says it gives you more time to be with people you love. Now, I think all those reasons are true. I think they're good. I think they're valid. But in my judgment, the primary, main reason you should be at your church's evening service is because the Lord is being gracious to you. How so? He's giving you an opportunity. You go to a church that gives you the opportunity to learn more about him through the preaching of his word. Listen, the only reason we have an evening service is to provide you, the members of our church, another opportunity to study God's word in an in-depth manner. Now, I realize that many churches don't have an evening service anymore. They now meet in homes for study or for fellowship or Sunday nights are encouraged to become family nights. And while these activities are certainly good and, and they're meaningful, there is nothing, and I say nothing more, nothing that will benefit you more, I should say, as a believer and help you to grow more in your faith than hearing and applying and understanding the exposition of the Word of God. Listen, do you realize how few hours in the week you have to sit under Bible teaching. But your church offers you the opportunity to have two full sermons each week taught by a pastor who has been called to equip you by teaching you the Word of God. But it saddens me that so few people come out on Sunday night to take advantage of this opportunity to be equipped. I am amazed and saddened at how often someone from Lakeside will tell me about a certain problem that they are struggling with. But in a recent sermon, we dealt with that problem. Recent sermon on Sunday night, we dealt with that very issue. But of course, they weren't here to hear it. 
Last Sunday night, we finished the study of the book of Daniel. Starting tonight, as Joe mentioned, it's in the bulletin. We start a new study, Paul's magnificent letter to the Ephesians. And let me tell you what's on my heart these days. There is no more majestic letter in all of Scripture than Ephesians. It will explain to you how God takes sinners who are dead in their sins and makes saints out of them, lifts them up to the heavenly places with Christ. It will explain to you how to live the Christian life, how to have victory over pornography and other sexual sins, how to have a great marriage, how to be fulfilled as an employee, how to resist Satan's temptations, and so much more. But you have to be here to benefit from this teaching. I am 62 years old, and you don't have to applaud. I am 62 years old. It is highly unlikely that I will ever have the opportunity to teach Ephesians again to you. Not in an in-depth, verse-by-verse approach. Folks, this is the time in our church's history that God has given us as a church body to learn what he has said in Ephesians. Now, perhaps if I live to be 110, who knows? You never say never, never, but I don't think this time is coming around again. This is the opportunity where you have to learn from what God has said in Ephesians. So what would I like to see at Lakeside in 2015? I'd like to see more of you come out. I'd like to see the church, the same, the same group that's here on Sunday mornings, come back on Sunday night. And listen, I, I'm the first one to, to admit, I understand it's not convenient. I understand it's a lot easier to just stay home. There are times where I want to stay home on Sunday nights. I understand that. I understand the pull of a football game that's not over yet. I understand what it means to be tired and Sunday nights you just like to relax. So what should you do? Come to church anyway. It's, there's a discipline involved. There's a discipline in the Christian life. But you say, but I don't feel like it. What, what about my motivation? Your motives will catch up to doing what's right. If we listen to our feelings all the time, we'd never do anything. Part of the Christian life is discipline. It's making forward progress regardless of how you feel. 